Good afternoon and welcome to our second live event. I'm Vicky Gilwa from Privacy Culture and I'll be joined in a moment by my partner, Steve Wright. Um, I'm going to tell you that I'm actually producing and presenting this week, so please bear with me because it's the first time that we've done it this way. Um, it's It's been a week, what a week. Um, last week we weren't even in lockdown. Um, news just in that the Prime Minister has coronavirus um, and Prince Charles as well. So, so much has gone on in the last week and Steve and I um, have got a lot to, to talk to you about as well from, from what we've seen. Um, the Prime Minister himself mentioned that it's only the wizardry of technology that's actually going to enable him to continue, hopefully um, um, in good health, to run the country um, in this situation. And from what I've seen and from some of the reports um, that are out there, you know, re remote working is right up on the list of people's main concerns now. So we're definitely going to unpack that. We've seen um, people really coming together this week. 600,000 people now have volunteered to support the NHS, um, looking after the 1.5 million vulnerable people. But unfortunately, with all of the good that's going on in this crisis, there's um, an opportunity for attack at the same time. Attackers, unfortunately, have turned their attention away from organisations, apparently, um, and are now looking at targeting individuals. Um, as the government has scrambled to try and get information out to different people in different ways, um, we've now seen them um, using the power of the mobile phone, um, getting text messages out to people um, with information about up-to-date advice on COVID-19. Um, I'm sure many of you, as soon as you saw that, thought, okay, well, that's a great idea, but a text like that with a link in it um, is, is surely going to mean that there will be a lot of copycat scams out there. In fact, Action Fraud have reported a 400% increase so far in March alone. So a lot of that is going on already. And I know that Steve and I um, have already picked up a number of copycat scams purporting to be text messages from the government. Um, on the flip side, you know, the community, the cybersecurity and privacy community were really coming together. Um, we've seen a lot of webinars in place. Um, the SASIC are doing a lot, not just on security, but on well-being as well, looking after yourself, looking after your business. Um, Jane Franklin's um, put out a great masterclass. I know I think she repeated it today and is continuing to do so to help smaller businesses and entrepreneurs. Um, so there's a lot of good things that are, are going on right now. So that's really, really positive. Um, and I think we all need to keep um, mindset um, at top of mind, really. You know, we need to keep a positive mindset. Um, I've started what I've called the uh, Corona size. Um, so, you know, I'm starting to get up in the morning and, and do some med meditation classes. I think a lot of people are doing things like that um, and getting out and exercising more in groups. Um, and, you know, just trying to take a really pragmatic approach to things. I'm meant to be moving house, so those new guidelines are going to make a huge difference. Um, and thinking about that, you know, in, in the privacy world, um, Steve, I've seen and read that um, the ICO are actually going to take quite a pragmatic approach to privacy. Um, but actually, and I'm going to I'm going to bring Steve to life here now. Hi, Steve. Um, but actually, um, there's quite a lot of nervousness potentially in different countries around um, how health data is is being um, managed during this time. Um, and I think that varies from country to country. I mean, what have you seen, Steve? What have you noticed in terms of how different countries are managing this? Well, um, first of all, hello, and uh, it's great to be here. So thank you um, for joining us this week. I, um, I well, certainly there have been certain um, authorities, data protection authorities that have taken the lead on this. And even earlier this month, the uh, Italian Garanti 
um, published some guidelines on what you can and can't do. And likewise, uh, only last week, uh, the CNIL, the French uh, Data Protection Authority, um, released their own guidelines. I, I think it's followed suit. You know, there, there's been a splattering of all the data protection officer, um, uh, authorities, sorry, um, responding to this crisis by saying, look, although, and we touched on this last week, although there, um, there's going to be a pragmatism around the, you know, how this is applied and certainly around the enforcement, what they are also saying is you can't still bend the rules. And that's really important. I think I use the analogy of um, just because there's no cars on the road, it doesn't mean you drive on the right. Um, well, here in the UK, anyway, <laughs> um, we drive on the left, as you know. So we still have to abide by these rules. We still have to, at the end of the day, put the consumer or the customer or the data subject at the heart of, of what it is we're asking. And this is, I think, particularly prevalent in health data because that's essentially, there's going to be a lot of requirements for employers to monitor their the health of their workforce, their staff, and um, that's quite important. But there are very um, strict guidelines and rules that we have to apply here. Um, so, so it's not gone away. I think, Vic, you know, like you've quite rightly said, um, lots is coming out. We, we we keep interpreting that as DPOs and, and advising accordingly. And um, but we ha we can't let our guard down um, just because of this unique, um, awful situation we find ourselves in. We can't let our guard down when it comes to being vigilant around personal data. Yeah, it's a really, some really great points in there, Steve, around not letting our guard down. Um, so I think with that, I, I kind of want to talk about, you know, what, what are the key things then um, that businesses can, can begin to focus on right now in terms of the particular areas? You know, I'm thinking about, for me, it's always training and awareness, but there's so much more um that that will in fact mean that training and awareness works um there are so many other areas in privacy and security that we need to focus on so can you just talk to a few of those elements um that you think could help the privacy culture of an organization at this time yep um sure so I think, as you know, um, Vic, I, I, this week I've had the pleasure of running some virtual classrooms um, for one particular client. It's the first time for me, like you, being a producer today. Um, can I get your autograph afterwards? <laughs> You'll have to post it to me. <laughs> but, um, you know, the, the, the virtual classroom uh, come at a really timely um, fashion because we, we never planned for it to be virtual, but as it happens, we are now all stuck at home and yet the training went ahead. And I think that was really good. And I was talking to the FD about how um, the value it is in reminding people about what they can do to make a difference. Small things, little things um, at home, um, to, you know, just things like and, and it's the age old challenge that we have. Um, around password, password strength and length and complexity. You know, I always use the three word principle where, you know, it's something, three separate words come together using um, alphanumeric and some sort of special characters and, and upper and lower case. And if you do that in a combination, it becomes very easy to remember. And the example I used in my classroom was uh, I have a black dog that's sat in on the sofa in the corner at the moment, and uh, it's my number one dog. Uh, so, you know, you've, you, if you write that out, that's incredibly difficult for these hackers um, with, with their brute force attacks to try and crack. I think the other thing is, um, you know, it, it, you know, as I said, you, you can't afford to let our guard down because, as you highlighted, there are these scams going on at the moment. I've received several from HMRC, um, one from proposing to be a school, um, you know, my school where my kids go. So, so people are unfortunately using this vulnerable time to try and, you know, infiltrate and glean information. And um, that aside, even this week, one of my clients actually had a data breach and we had to investigate it yesterday. And, and it transpires that in, in most of these cases, it looks like it was a, you know, a dormant account, 
but as I was explaining to the um, to the team that very often criminals don't always reveal themselves. They do it very subtly. And this is where it gets very difficult to identify some of these. So once they've once they've gained access to your computer or your device, um, because you may have a weak password or you've, you've not changed the password on your router at home or things like that, um, they, they can then slowly but surely ebb away and, and pull data from you. So I think it's it's stuff we already know, but of course, in this time, you know, we've got other things on my mind. I'm homeschooling at the moment and I've never done that before. And I have to say it's hard work. So my, I really take my hat off to those school teachers. <laughs> Please take my kids, um, you know, but we're, we're, we're trying or I'm trying to in, in, in install in them the dangers of just clicking on these links. And at the same time, I'm promoting them to to do their homework and to, and to follow this link and, and all that kind of good stuff. So it's incredibly hard, but incredibly important at this time of, of national crisis. Great points there. And yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's such a focus now on remote or home working and people have had to really look at their own devices as well and, and check to see whether they're secure. Um, and I've noticed a lot of companies providing um, help and assistance um, on that and even service desks into that to, to support them wherever they can. Um, so in addition to that, I mean, it just, it just feels like to me as if there is a, there's quite a lot of weight on the people at home really um, we always talk about awareness we always talk about these are the things you need to do and you know I think a lot of us are getting better at providing the how-to guidance now we recognize we can't just say to people you need to do x it's, it's well how how do I do it you know I've I've, I'm, I've got an iMac or you know I'm on an Android device and yeah how do I connect how do I get through how do I, I behave securely um, how do I protect personal data um, but so Aside from that, and I'm thinking about um, Privacy Culture's maturity framework, what other areas could organisations concentrate on now to, to really to help, you know, in, in essence, um, prevent a breach ultimately, um, but so that we take some of the burden perhaps um, off of the workforce? Um. Uh, yeah, OK, so I think for me, Vic, this 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 is a good time to be thinking about um, improving pr procedures, processes. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, I've been asked uh, to potentially get involved with with a client because they are currently doing um, multiple privacy impact assessments. Um, you know, they're coming through, the requests are coming through internally from different um, divisions, um, different countries. And, you know, they're, they're asking the question, is this the most efficient way to um, identify the privacy risks associated to this and, and then treat and come up with a treatment with that? So I think my point there is like the legitimate interest assessments or the lawful basis um, training that I've been providing this week. Um, it, it's really good to, to have a, to use this opportunity to think about how can we mature our processes, you know, and and simplify them because the more integrated, the more simplified they are, the, the more likely people are to follow them. And also, this is a lot to do as well with working out your risk um, appetite. You know, what's your threshold that you're willing to to take, or the level of risk you're willing to accept, bearing in mind obviously legal minimum requirements um, both you know within the EU but but globally uh, data protection laws around the world and and just getting that balance is something that we can be doing and and I dare say in fact in, in most of the organizations that I support now um, whenever I go in there and ask around the um, how they're identifying the privacy risks and then and then how they're treating and tracking the treatment of those privacy risks I always get a sort of a bit of a scratching head moment or, or a kind of awkward silence. And so I wonder whether this is now a good time 
for us to go back to the basic risk methodology, working with our CISOs and our security colleagues and saying, well, hang on, how are you identifying the risks? What are the risks specifically to us from a privacy perspective? And how does that tie in with the controls or the, or the privacy policies and controls that uh, um, framework that we've stipulated? The other thing I would say was around um, small little things. So you asked about us individually. So there's, there's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, um, one of the things I said to, to the people that I was teaching this week is um, a lot of people don't understand that by sharing your device, which you're going, to, you're, you're more likely to do because you're at home and, you, and, you're, and you've got several kids as I have all asking, demanding um, to have access to, to devices so they can get online and look at school resources. Um, there is different things you can do about setting up your user profile. So you can have multiple user profiles on one machine, and that's a very good way of doing that. And you don't have to, or in certain circumstances, you don't always have to have admin rights to do that. Now, obviously talk to your IT departments, your technology departments. And the other thing I kept on saying was um, these wonderful devices that we're issued with um, when, when whenever we go to a client. Uh, it, 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 um, the encryption only works when the device is off. So if it's BIOS encryption, that only works when the device is switched down. So if you control alt delete or you walk away from your laptop or you close the lid down, then actually you've not protected. So if you were um, to lose or, or unfortunately, you know, get broken into or something was to happen, then that is in an open state and therefore it's vulnerable to the, some of those brute force attacks that we touched on. Um, and then um, I think the final thing I would say is about um, using this opportunity, certainly in a maturity circle, around um, retention. So, so look, we've all got local saved uh, data, right? Now's a good time to uh, actually think about culling your data or cleaning up your C drive, putting it back into your SharePoint or back into the shared drives of your work or your organization. So really, this is a sort of amnesty to go, well, hang on, I've got a really clean desktop. So even if my desktop is or my device is compromised, um, I've done, uh, I've completely cleaned it up. And don't forget about these devices, these lovely little things where, as I pointed out, uh, much to the horror of my FD yesterday, I said, look, you do realize this is my own device. OK, and if I tap here and I look and I download this file that someone's has sent me in the, t you know, because I've set it up on Outlook, then it's now stored here. <laughs> and so that's proliferation or data leakage, which is such a common problem for most organisations. And I think actually one more thing, Vic, if I, if I may, if I may, I know I'm pushing it, but I'm <laughs> just going to squeeze this in. Just this little one. Um, also, I'd say this is a great opportunity for us um, as data protection officers and CPOs alike um, to think about the roles and responsibilities and the segregation of duties. Now, I'll give you this as a scenario. I had a situation, this was only this morning, where um, I've been asked to, to consider this dilemma. And the dilemma is, um, OK, so you've got everyone working from home and you've got a data science team and you know, your your friend in um, your colleague that normally sits two door two steps away from or even in a separate department separate office he's online he's on slack he's on whatever mechanism you've got to communicate and he's asking you just to briefly have a look at his code because he wants you to do this or can you run this um, simulation for me so what can inadvertently happen in terms of that is is this whole um, if you like downgrading of people's roles and responsibilities uh, it, it, it doesn't happen because or sorry it happens because what we're doing is we're letting our guard down we're all collaborating we're trying to do our best and I'm not suggesting for a moment we don't continue to collaborate and communicate but I'm just talking about how how we need to still think about that segregation of duty and those roles and responsibilities. And by and large, 
when I've looked at privacy teams and offices around the world, one of the first questions I asked a DPO CPO is, have you defined your services? Have you defined your roles and responsibilities? Does everybody know what they're responsible for? And when does that, when does it, that, that sort of end and start, you know, in terms of that handover? And herein lies the dilemma because obviously there's a big ethics issue here. Could the same team be accessing the same data um, is that ethically okay? And and how do you how do you maintain that segregation of, of duty? That's all I'm going to say. That was a little bit longer. <laughs> so apologies for that. No, that's great. That's great. I think you make some really really good points there um, about the segregation piece and the roles and responsibilities. And you touched on ethics as well. And I think a lot of companies will be considering um, the ethical use of of personal data during this crisis as well. Um, from a you know from a training and awareness point of view, this is just my my own reflection now. I wonder whether there will be sort of an upskilling and a shift we'll see um, that employees now um, because they've kind of had to fend for themselves at home a lot more um, had to find out things for themselves do things for themselves use their own devices um, and be more conscious of the security of their own devices and the protection of their own data as well as organizations um, I think you know we, we might have to you know as, a, as an industry ourselves start to look at how we train them slightly differently, you know, knowing that they perhaps know a bit more. Um, you know, as as you know, Steve, um, the way that we always look at things is to have a conversation first anyway with people in the organisation, know your audience is totally key, find out who the people are um, and what they need. I mean, people generally do the, want to do the right thing anyway, and it's normally something else that's actually stopping them from doing the right thing. It might be that the process is difficult to navigate. It might be the tools are hard. Um, and once we know all those things up front, then we we generally go in and create our, our guidance um, with all of that in mind to provide the best experience um, for the people in the organisation. But I'm looking forward to seeing that that upshift um, in people's knowledge um, and that landscape change. Um, and sort of leading off from there, um, we've decided to run um, one of our own virtual classrooms. And so on Wednesday, the the 1st of April. Um, Steve and I will be talking to you uh, about training and awareness um, in the privacy and security landscape. So that's next Wednesday and more details on that to follow. Um, and Steve started to talk to you there about um, maturity, privacy maturity. Um, and the following week, I believe it's on the 8th, Wednesday the 8th, yeah. we're going to run another virtual classroom um, so that we can talk to you uh, about maturity and of course in between um, we'll carry on with our 2pm sessions as well um, and hopefully next week we might be able to to share the screen together so that that's our aim anyway um, but hopefully it's not been um, too bad an experience for you all today it's been an interesting experience for us to try it anyway um, so let's see if we we have any questions in the question window? So, okay. I'm glad you're driving, Vic. I'm glad. I'm glad you're in the driving seat. <laughs> I can't, you, know, you know me so well. I can't. I can't multitask. I'll do, I, it'll be a car crash. There'll be all sorts of no, things going on. No, not at all. <clears throat> um, so we have a question here. Um, Steve, do you think that people are right to be concerned about sharing of medical data during this crisis? Um, yeah, I was just looking at that question. That's a really good question, actually. Uh, sorry, I've got to put my glasses on, which means you get the reflection. But um, to read the question, I think, um, look, in, in times of national crises, you know, like this, and, and this is unprecedented because it's a global pandemic, but uh, we need to share data in order to fight this thing, to, to learn from it and, and to collaborate on, on how we defeat it and, and build up the immunity. Um, so there is a big, you know, absolute um, necessity to share this medical data. I'm concerned, you know, we're all concerned um, about the proliferation of our privacy rights during this time. Um, you know, we we should count ourselves lucky in some respects that um, we don't live in um, certain countries where those those rights are systematically 
uh, compromised. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the thing to remember is uh, a lot of the medical um, profession have uh, the HIPAA in the US, our colleagues across the pond, um, and, and obviously we have the cold cut uh, principles uh, and the you know, clinical guidelines, which are quite stringent on the requirements of you know, the principles of privacy. Um, and, and so the NHS, just like, and, and most health providers, as far as I'm concerned, all tend to operate when they're collaborating or sharing data. Um, f firstly, on, on an encryption basis, but more importantly, on an anonymized basis. And I think that's incredibly important that, yes, we don't mind sharing uh, this medical information and, and we actively encourage it, but we would expect that to be anonymized data. Um, we also know, I mean, you know, to, to quote um, uh, Andrea uh, Jelinek, the chair of the European Data Protection Board, um, she's just recently said that the um, data protection rules such as GDPR do not hinder measures taken in a fight against the coronavirus pandemic. However, um, she says, I would like to underline that even in these exceptional times, the data controller, so that would be the NHS or, or, or a trust within, within the NHS, as you know, it's made up of multiple trusts. Um, uh, must ensure the protection of that personal data and of the data subject, and and therefore, you know, the same the same principles apply, right? This goes back to the lawful basis, which I'll you know cover off on the eighth of um, uh, Wednesday, the eighth of April at two p.m. Uh, you know, we'll drill into this a little bit more and and look at those six lawful basis of processing data, and just talk about legitimate interest in particular, because that keeps coming up. So, so I do um, think that, yes, we all, you know, we should naturally be um, concerned about our data and we should naturally uh, be concerned about who's got it and, and where it is. But in actual fact, these are exceptional times. And as long as we hope that the um, authorities are, are using anonymized data, I mean, there are cases where it can't be anonymized and it shouldn't be anonymized, but that's, that's for another day. But, you know, gen generally speaking, um, I think we've got to do everything we can to share what we're learning, um, both within the EU and where where we have um, adequate um, safeguards in place uh, you know, further afield, uh, you know, outside of the EEA. Great, Steve, some really, really good points there. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm glad that there are groups um, like the Cyber Volunteers 19 who are helping the health organisations at this time um, protect their data um, in the, during this crisis. So I think that just about, oh, hold on, hold on. I thought that was it, but it looks like there might be another question. Oh, OK, yeah, we have another question. So any advice on where to find a list of scams and phishing emails. Well, I, I can answer that. Um, as actually, Steve, I have to, to apologise. I inadvertently forgot to put you to live for the first few seconds of your your last speech. <laughs> but, but you were in the live window in the end. Um, <laughs> it's OK. We're, we're all learning, right? These are new we're ways of working. We learn every day. So. Doing things. Yeah, we're used to sort of managing to talk face to face and it's quite it's different. Um, so list of scams and phishing emails. I would recommend Action Fraud. Um, I subscribe to Action Fraud and they, that's where I found out um, that the scams had gone up 400% in March. Um, we are actually compiling a list um, of phishing, vishing and smishing scams ourselves, um, as there are so many. Um, Call, and we're going to call it Scam Watch. So please do feed any to us um, via LinkedIn or via our website. Um, anything that you wanted to add before we round up, Steve? Yeah. Um, am I live? <laughs> I'm, you, right? I'm yes. playing with you now. I'm <laughs> playing with you. <laughs> um, yeah. No, thank you. I, I think. Um, I think. You know, the messages here are, are really useful. Um, we, uh, Vic and I, and the team, actually, there's a whole team behind us here. So a big thank you to them. Uh, it's not just us. We, we are all in this together. And I think, to your point, Vic, it, it's really useful and helpful if 
um, you tell us what you want to hear about and uh, you give us feedback and you ask more questions and we're trying to address those um, we're trying to address those issues if, if we can and if appropriate. I think the um, it's, it's fair to say that one of the ways, <laughs> now this is, sounds a bit odd, but one of, one of the ways that I've always worked and, and by and large I've, I've worked from home an awful lot, but I know this would be new for a lot of people, um, is, is by just making lists and um, you know some people do this naturally and they make lists and I am a big list guy right and and all I'm saying is um, my advice to you <laughs> is uh, don't make the list too long <laughs> and also try try to make the list the to-do list um, things that you can achieve in that day and you can realistically achieve in that day because the reason I say that is um, I, I, I'm looking up at the multiple list I've got on my pin board up here. Um, I, I tend to list them out and they're so long that I never get to the bottom of it. And, and, and therefore you can, that can have a negative effect on you. And I think we've got to be really careful about mental health during this um, difficult time. And so I just wanted to say to those data protection officers and, and the various CISOs that I know um, over the year, I, I am more than happy to jump on a video call or, or pick up the phone or call, contact us on LinkedIn. Um, we're not we're not a sort of self help group, <laughs> but we um, we're all in this together, and there's a lot of collaboration we can do here. Um, and there's there's some thought leadership that I've been working with, um, looking at with Queen Mary University. Uh, which which would be good because it takes our mind off some of the um, awful stresses and strains of this. So so my message really is um, you know just a bit of a watch out for mental health and and staying healthy both physically and mentally. That's back to you, producer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We all need to look after each other and out for each other. And you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, and I will every week. We're seeing so much collaboration now um, it's fantastic and I think we all need to continue to support each other not just at home um, but in the industry as well um, as Steve mentioned um, next Friday we're going to be focusing on local basis and legitimate interest but if there's anything else that you want us to discuss um, if you want to join us on screen then 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 do please reach out via LinkedIn um, we have a, an email hello at privacyculture.com we also have a website privacyculture.com so so come and find us um, and talk to us and we will see you next week hopefully at the virtual training classroom on Wednesday more to follow um, or next Friday um, so do take care have a lovely weekend and we'll see you all very soon yes thank you thanks, thanks. a lot bye have a great week <laughs> <laughs>